dreamed another dream, and this time the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars bowed down to me. So he told it to his father and his brothers, and his father even rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall your mother and I and your brothers indeed come bow down to the earth before you? And his, brother, his brothers envied him, but his father kept the matter in mind. Here, here, right here, too, you can see the difference between young, immature brothers, right, who still aren't, are, have insecurities. They're not confident in who they are. They're, they're, they're shaken by this. What do you mean? Right? And there, there's envy there. But his father, who's mature, kept this matter in mind. Because when God gives you a dream and God speaks to you, guess what? God's the one who's going to show forth his glory when it comes to pass, and you, people get to watch and go, wow, look at what God did. Wow, what they saw and what they heard really was God. And sometimes we get impatient with the Lord, and we abandon or we check out on things because it gets tough when God's like, come on, no, stay faithful. I want to show you something. He said, uh, let me get back to my spot here. And his brothers envied him, but his father kept this matter in mind. Then his brothers went to feed the father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. So he said to him, here I am. Then he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and went to Shechem. Now a certain man found him, and there he was wandering in the field. And that man asked him, saying, what are you seeking? So he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they have departed from here. So I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near, they conspired against him to kill him. So I want to back up a little bit and talk about the dream here for a second, because this is the thing about God. God is omniscient. He's all powerful and he's all knowing. God knows everything, the future, the end, the beginning, your whole life, right? God knows all this. And sometimes people get wrapped up in that dynamic and that well if God knows it all well then what's the point right because it's just going to happen anyways how he knows it like we don't have any kind of interaction with God in this thing right like the whole Calvinistic view of salvation is well who God wants to be saved is going to be saved and who's going to hell is going to hell already so what's the point of witnessing which is so contrary to the command of the great commission okay God didn't say you're omniscient and all-knowing he said I am omniscient (laughs) all-knowing So it's not our job to try to become know-it-alls. It's our job to have faith in his promise and what he said and to be obedient to what he commanded us, and that's to share our faith. It's not up to us to go, well, if people are going to hell anyway, what's the point? In fact, there might be a couple that I'm thinking about that I really want to go to hell because I don't like them. So what's the point of preaching to them? No, God doesn't want us to have this mindset because he wants to use us. So if he was to shut us down and be like, hey, don't worry about it, I know who's coming and who's going anyways. Y'all just take, hang out and do nothing. <laughs> no, that's, that's religious and that's bad stinking thinking. God wants to interact with you in your life. And the cool thing about this dream and the dream that he can give you is it's a glimpse of your future. You can have an imagination that's pure, that God puts his plan and his will in your life. In fact, the Bible says, eye has not seen nor ear has heard the things that God has planned for them that love him. But it says, but we have by the Spirit. He has revealed these things by the Spirit. This is in 2 Corinthians, or uh, 1 Corinthians, I think, chapter 2. And he's, he's basically saying, if you get in, with the, in the Spirit and you let the Holy Spirit in that place in your life, he will begin to speak to you about things to come. He'll begin to show you not only that, but he'll protect you. Some of my dreams aren't dreams of, you know, wealth and riches. Sometimes my dreams are dreams about protection and, hey, watch out for that person. Hey, be careful over here. I had a dream one time. I was, this is when we were working uh, in a ministry and this, what what I like to call in ministry, you kind of have different ways of, you know, some people are, are there for the right reasons and some people are there because they got money. And they try to influence stuff. They try to buy their power. And 
there was a couple that started hanging out, and they had lots of money. So the minister was <laughs> really like that a couple. And started giving them attention and sitting with them and talking with them. Well, I had this dream, and God showed me, and it was like I was on a phone call listening. Remember back in the days when you could pick up the line in the house and listen when somebody's talking? And then you then you if you if you're real smart, you can hear him pick it up and you'd be like, get off the phone, I'm on the phone. But you could, if there was another line in the house, you could click in and try to spy and listen in. Well, in the dream, I was listening in on a phone call, and they were speaking very derogatory about me. They were speaking in a way that was not God's voice for my life. And God was showing me, and he was showing me what was, what was coming. And a week later, this man approached my wife and came and began to say very negative, derogatory things about me to my wife. Didn't come to me personally. This is another way you know it's the devil. This is the way you know the enemy's working. Because when it's God, there's no fear, right? You're there. You're delivering. God. If it's from the Lord, then there's no fear. I can come straight to you and tell you what I feel, what I think. Because that's pure. That's from my heart. It's pure. But if I were to, like, try to do it some other way, and be like, oh, I'm going to tell somebody that's close to him about his business and about what I think, and then they're going to go and, you know, puke it up all on it. That's not God. Anyways, this dream revealed to me this person's intention and their motive. And when it happened, I felt so, I just felt loved. I felt loved by God. I felt like, God, you're so good. I didn't get offended. I didn't get hurt. I just stood there with strength. And I let whatever happened, and my wife knew about it because I had told her about the dream. So she was already, like, watching this thing come to pass in front of her as well. So she was guarded. Because the enemy this and affect this. So whatever you hear people say about stuff, judgments, criticism, let me tell you, the devil lives in those places. He loves the dark. He loves to sneak around and talk and gossip and get people saying one thing about you and paint, paint a picture about you. People don't even know you thinking things about you. The devil loves it because that's where he, he works. That's where he controls. Because if he can control the way I see you, then he can get me to speak and lie and begin to agree with what he says about your life. It's a tactic of the enemy. We need to get around people who speak God's word over our life. And, and, and if it is a word of correction or they're coming in with exhortation to, to correct you or to tell you something, then it should be done in a manner that is biblical, right? You go to the person yourself, you tell them what you're feeling, what you see, and then you have a discussion. If they don't hear you and they're stubborn, then you can bring some more people, sit down with them and talk to them. And if they still don't hear you, there's a process by which we do these. People that are immature, they bypass that process process. They just ignore it. Even though it's in the Bible, they'll just, poof, I don't care why, because their emotions and their anger or their bitterness is leading their life instead of God. And I know we kind of got into a little bit of a, but this is, this is something that you need to protect your dream and to see God's will come to pass in your life. Because let me tell you, God has a will and a plan for your life. He wants you to fulfill everything he puts in front of you. And the Bible says, whatever you put your hand to shall be blessed. But what does the devil want to do? The devil wants to come in and pollute it and pervert it and sabotage it and destroy it and disrupt it. And the only way he gets in is through dysfunctional, corrupt people that aren't truly yielded to God. And the devil uses it. And they're in the church. So we have to keep our heart pure. That's why we build strong relationships. We don't hide out in the back. We're not like disconnected and not letting people get to know us. No, we want to be known. We want people to know where we're at, where our struggles are. People that are hurting, they need healing. People that have been rejected or dejected or have, have lost or maybe they had a dream and it didn't come to pass and they've given up on their dream, they've given up on what God told them, and they're in a place of bitterness and resentment, a broken marriage. Let me tell you, broken marriages can really do a number on people, can get them very dysfunctional in, in a place of victimhood, and they never can break free. 
and see life and see their dreams come to pass because they get bogged down and in bondage. And I pray this morning that none of us in this room will be those, but we'll let the Holy Spirit come in and free us and heal us and deliver us and give us the ability to forgive those that have hurt us. Give us the ability to speak life over those who curse us. That's, that's the Spirit of God. That's him doing that in us. Thank you, Lord. They conspired against him to kill him. They hated him so much. They were so bitter and jealous of him that they wanted to kill their, their brother. Their brother. They wanted to see him die. Then they said to one another, look, this dreamer is coming, right, mocking him. Look, at here comes the dreamer. Here comes the guy who thinks he's, he knows it all. He thinks he's great. Yeah, let's, let's show him how great he is and let us now cast him into some pit. And we shall say some wild beast has devoured him, right? This is what they do. They're liars. They're not truthful. They're creating and inventing a scheme. We shall see what will become of his dreams, but Reuben heard it, and he delivered him out of their hands. So he had one brother that loved him, that was connected to him. And, and he said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So he had a plan, and he wanted to help Joseph. And so it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. Then they took him and cast him into a pit. Now I want you to keep this in mind. The whole time this uh, circumstance or this is happening to him, the dream is still real. The dream is God's vision and version of his life is still there before him. But look at what he's going through. He's being uh, beaten and, and scourged and ripped the, that jacket ripped off his back. And he's going through hardship and he's going through a time where he had to embrace the wrath of his brothers or his haters. But God, we're going to see God use all this for his glory, for his purposes. And they sat down to eat a meal. Then they lifted their eyes and looked, and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming to Galid with their camels, bearing spices, balm, and myrrh on their way to carry them down to Egypt. So Judah said to his brothers, What profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come and let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then Midianites traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. Then Reuben returned to the pit, and indeed Joseph was not in the pit. So his brother comes back to look for him, and he's not there. But they didn't kill him, and I believe this is part of God's providence and plan. When others are trying to kill you, when others are trying to get you to see your failure, God's in the mix and he's working things out for your good. This is a promise that you can have. So when you're in turmoil, you're going through something like that scripture I read in the beginning. You're not looking to man and blaming, right? Oh, my brothers, if only my brothers weren't so jealous of me, I could have been somebody in my life, right? Making excuses no, he doesn't make excuses. He goes through the process. And I, and I believe that Joseph had a relationship with God. I believe that Joseph had a heart for his heavenly father. A, a wild beast had devoured him. Without jo doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his clothes. So they tell his dad. His dad tears his clothes and puts sackcloth on his waist and mourns for his son for many days. I mean, this is a horrible thing for them to have done. Hurt, hurt their dad, hurt the family, make them think he's dead and gone, and ho like have this secret, right, for years. And some of us may be in this room and we got secrets, buried secrets, things we did in the past. The, maybe relationships with family members. You got a cousin or a brother or, or somebody that you won't talk to because of some things that are in the past. And God wants to free you up. He doesn't want that thing haunting you. He doesn't want you having that bitterness towards your family. 
you can still love them and still have a freedom over what they did wrong to you because Jesus is good and his love forgave you all of your trespasses. So we have to forgive those who've trespassed against us. And it's not easy. It's not easy to forgive somebody that's hurt you or abused you in a way, right? It's, you can't just, you just need to forgive. What are you talking about forgive? I want to kill somebody, right? That's the real emotions that we feel. But you can't do it outside of God's presence. That's why this Psalm 61, hear my cry, O God, attend to my prayer. This is what I'm going through, God. I want to kill my uncle for what he did to me. But God, hear my cry. Help me. Help me love him the way you've loved me. It's an interaction with God over the issue. It's not an interaction with men. It's you coming to God and making it right with him and forgiving and letting it go and then letting that spill over into the actual relationship because you can't do it in your own strength. You're going to need a heavenly strength to come over you. His father wept. Now the Midianites had sold him into Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and the captain of the guard. We see the hand of God on Joseph. Not only his favor and protection is still there, even though he's going through this trial, but there is God's already positioning him, and there's favor because he, see, this is the thing about God. He's just so incredible the way he, his mind is. You know, people that play chess, you have to be like moves ahead. You can't play chess like you do checkers, right? I mean, there's a little bit of strategy, but ch chess is a lot more intricate, and there's a lot more moves that can be made. So if you're a good chess player, you're not looking at the move you're making right now. You're looking at three or four moves down the road and hoping that they make moves that go along with what you're doing so that you can win. It's strategy. And the enemy is very strategic in our life, but God is the greatest strategist of all, right? And if you go back and read the book of Ruth, or, or not Ruth, Esther, the story of Esther, and how the whole time they were planting her demise, that, that bad guy was going after her, right? Was it um, Haman? And he, he was like, You're, we're gonna, when they start, he started building the gallows, he's going to hang them on. And, and then the next thing you know, the whole story turned around. And guess who's hanging on the gallows? Haman. Because God is good. He's awesome. He, and not only that, but he loves his children. And when you have a relationship with him, and it's not just for, for when it's feel good, right? It's not just come in, listen to songs, and you feel good in a moment. But then it, the rest of your life, you have no God in your life. You have no relationship, no connection, no conversations with him. That's religion. This is an overflow. We come here to overflow. This is a part of our, like, to get filled up, but then to splash out, right? You need God. You need community so that God can do the work he wants to do in your life, but also so that he can use you. If all you do is come to church to hear songs and to hear a message, but it never gets down in your life and starts to shake you and shift the way you see reality, then you, you're just, you got religion. Because the real God comes in to, to shake the core of your being, to loose you from the grips of hell, to loose you from the devil's sway and his influence in your life and connect you with his influence. The Holy Spirit becomes the thing that dwells on the inside of you. So wherever you go, whatever you think, there is this being that's living who begins to challenge you. It challenges you when you have a stinking attitude. It challenges you when, you, when, you, when you're stingy, stingy with your time, that God will come in and begin to deal with your heart and be like, hey, well, come on. Look how much I gave. Look at what I did for you. Don't you think you could give? Don't you think you could be here when you say you'd be here? Don't you think you, could, you can be committed and be faithful? That's God coming in and challenging your life. And we have to let him in. We can't run from those places. It's not a case of raw, raw attitude. Whatever will be, will be. Like people think that, well, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. 
you know, I don't believe this is biblical. I don't think that we walk around saying, well, if God wants it to happen, it's going to happen. If that's the case, uh, how do you explain all the child trafficking and abuse? You think God wants all those people molested and children uh, abused? That's a religious nonsense that religious people say to other religious peoples. Well, if God wants it to happen, it'll happen. To, to sometimes, you know, you fail. Sometimes things fail, and it's because they fail. It's not because God wanted it to happen. Sometimes it's because people didn't step up. People didn't do their job. Businesses sometimes fail because sometimes the people running it, they're not really f- focused on the business. They're focused on something else. But that's not God wanting that business to fail. Or God wanted you to be abused or you had, you know, a woman who went through when they were younger, they were raped. You think God wanted that to happen? No. So it's not a case, sirrah, sirrah. God, whatever God wants is going to happen. Yeah, maybe in the scheme of the end times, when, it, when all this is on a timer and God, you know, at some point he's saying it's going to end, it's going to end. But that doesn't mean that now we just check out and don't do anything for them. Right? The reason why sex traffickers go to prison and get caught is because there's somebody that takes up a cause and says, you know what, I'm going after them. And that's the same thing with your life and the purpose in your life. It's not just going to happen because it falls out of the sky. You're going to have to pursue it and get in there with God to see the dream come to pass. I don't think Joseph is in this experience thinking, God, you failed me. God, oh, I'm so mad and bitter. If he would have bit, gotten bitter and mad and rebelled against God, maybe none of what happens in this story would have taken place. But it was because of his heart. It was because of his character. And we're going to see that in this next part. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, captain of the guard, an Egyptian, brought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph. See, the Lord was with him. The Lord is with you and I through everything. He says, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And sometimes when you're in pain and you're lonely and you're going through a struggle, it feels like God is not there. But let me tell you, if you love the Lord and, he, and you worship him, he is there with you. I can't remember one challenging time in my life that I did not turn to God and begin to worship him where I did not feel his presence. People say that. I never got that. I'm, you're just in the desert. You're in a dry season. Everybody has their dry seasons. It's just God just takes you through a time where he, he just makes you feel like he's not there. And it's like I don't know how to relate to that. I've been through trying times, but the, the thing that God's given me is a tool and that's worshiping him and blessing him. Yeah, maybe if I keep my mouth shut and I don't come to him and I don't pray and I don't spend time with God, then I'll be like, it's real dry around here. I don't feel God. But if I humble myself and I get before him and I begin to worship him, Lord, I lift your name on high, right? Or whatever worship song. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Right, come fl- and some of us guys here who've never sang are thinking, "You want me to sing to God? <laughs> I don't sing. Well, then slap your knee or something. <laughs> you know, if you play the spoons, get out your spoons. <laughs> Break off that slumber and that depression and that thing that's coming you and telling you that God's not there and God's dry and you're in a dry season." No, there's a well that lives on the inside of you. The Holy Spirit's a well you can tap into, and he can pour out all through your life, and you can feel him and experience him. And he can bring peace to your struggle. He can, sh- all, of a sudden, all of a sudden, there's things called suddenly, and suddenly things shift. And what your life looked like a month before, it's completely different a month later because he's good. He's faithful, and he's a miracle-working God. And his master saw the Lord was with him and that the Lord made all he did to prosper in his hand. God wants your life to prosper. God's not looking to bring you to a place of misery, depression, and poverty so that he can teach you a lesson. 
No, that's religion and that's the devil. The devil wants you to get caught up in this that God just wants you to be humble. So he's going to, no, sometimes you lose money because you're irresponsible with it. Sometimes you have to take responsibility for why you're broke and you don't have no money. Maybe it's not God's fault. Maybe it's our fault. <laughs> I know it's a little heavy, but come on, it's the truth. God wants us to prosper. People get out there and they say, oh, that prosperity gospel. Oh, they're preaching that prosperity gospel. I don't know any other gospel. Uh, is there a poverty gospel that you know of? That I, that I, ha I mean, he said that he became rich, right? He became poor so that you could become rich. It says the blessing of God makes one rich and he adds no sorrow to it. There is a prosperity that God has for your life, but it comes in a relationship and being with God. It doesn't come because you're religious. It becomes because there's a relationship you, you have with him. And then when he begins to get in your business, your finances, and begins to show you, hey, you see this area? You're not honoring me in this area. So this is why the enemy's coming in, and he's robbing from you, and you're broke. Hey, you know, Sometimes people are broke because they don't work. That's not God's fault. Sometimes ministers who are ministering, <laughs> they don't have no money because they choose to be poor, and they surround themselves with a bunch of people who believe they should be poor. No, thank you. I'll find a different church. I'm not, I'm not serving people who want the preacher poor. Why? Because that's a, a representation of what you think about God. You think God's poor? No, he's rich. And he wants to bless you. That doesn't mean that you make it your aim now to go get a jet and go get a Lamborghini and look at me, I'm prosperous, I'm rich, look at me, yeah, right? Driving around town, f flossing, whatever they call it. Is that what it's called? <laughs> Flaunting or bling bling or whatever. <laughs> When I come around your city, bling, bling. Nobody knows that reference. Anyways, that's 90s, 90s rap, okay? <laughs> Anyways, it's the heart. I think God loves to bless people. I think God loves when you're not all burdened down with bills and stressing out about, where, how am I going to take care of my family? How am I going to feed my family? You think God's heart's like, yeah, that's right where I want him. If anything, the, the reason why he wants you there is so that you turn to him and say, God, you said you're my provider. Show me. Come, you are God that owns everything. Nothing's hidden from you. You can give me whatever I need. God, I'm opening my life. What do you need me to do? Get off your butt and go get a job. Oh, what? I don't know if that's God. No, you have to listen to him. He'll guide you. He'll give you direction. And he'll bless you, he'll give you favor. He'll put you in a good job, a good position. And the one you have, sometimes people lose their jobs and they start freaking out. Oh no, what am I gonna do? What if, if you have a connection with God, I always heard this and in my life, I, I'm telling you, I've seen it. It's like you lose one, but God promotes you. The next one's better. The next opportunity you have is a better opportunity. God's good, he's faithful. Amen. So we see the hand of God is with Joseph. And now he's serving. And Joseph's no slouch. He's, he's an excellent man. He does things with excellence. He's not cutting corners. He's not looking at how to, you know, get out of the responsibilities. He's, he has an excellent spirit, which comes from God. God wants us to be like him. God is a God of excellence. He's not a half but God, he's an all in, I'm giving it all, and he's very detailed, and he's good at what he does. And he wants us to be the same way. He wants us to carry the same integrity and character. And here, this part, here we get to the part where Joseph's helping, he's cleaning, he's doing it, but now, uh-oh, here's, here's the test, right? Thus he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. He left everything. He, he was running this man's house. He wasn't, he wasn't, you know, hurting. He was doing very well. He had a great position. Except, here's this man's wife, right? Lonely housewife. 
this cougar, looking at young man, lusting after him. And it says it right here. Now, Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. And it came to pass after these things that his master's wife cast longing eyes on Joseph. Babe, can you cast longing eyes on me? <laughs> what does that look like, by the way, longing eyes? Is that like, I mean, what does that look like? <laughs> Longing eyes. I mean, if I was Joseph and I saw some longing eyes, depending on, <laughs> I'd be like, oh, what the heck? But you see her go after him, and she said, lie with me. But he refused. See, this is God's character in him. This is God in him. His flesh, I'm sure, if God wasn't in the picture, he's like, all right, let's hook it up, right? But no, he's one, he has a heart after God, after God's holiness, after his purity, after who he is. And says to his master's wife, look, my master does not know what is with me in, this, in the house, and he has committed all that he has to my hand. There is no one greater in this house than I, nor has he kept back anything from me but you, because you are his wife, stupid. Just kidding. He didn't say stupid. How then can I do this great wickedness, great wickedness in sin against God? So you see here his, his heart, and his heart is that I want to honor God. And if I did this with you, it would be a great sin against my God who, who would be displeased with my actions. So you see that Joseph isn't just in this situation, and he's a victim, and he's busted. No, he, he's doing the best with what he has. He's putting all his heart into it with his trust in his God and remembering, I'm sure, he has that dream somewhere in the back of his spirit that he's knowing that, man, I remember that dream. I remember that dream. I remember what God said. I'm not looking at my circumstances and folk. No, I'm thinking about God and the journey that he's taking me through. And he's learning. He's learning. So it was, as she spoke to Joseph day by day, that he did not heed her to lie with her and be with her. So she's not just the one time. This, she's working on him. She's trying to play him. She's trying to get him to wear him down and, and get him to, to fall and to basically sin against God because that's the devil. That's the devil in her driving to trying to get a foothold in his life. But when Joseph went into the house to do his work and none of the men of the house was inside, that she caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and ran outside. Could you imagine that? It was that quick. He acted like he was scared to death of her. Hey, whoa, runs outside naked. No, thank you. No, ma'am, you ain't getting me. The he, uh, he came to lie with me. Okay, here it is. Sorry. And so it was when she saw him and he left his garment in her hand and fled outside that she called to the men of her house and spoke to them, saying, See, he has brought to us a Hebrew to mock us. He came in to lie with me. She's lying. Again, more liars, more people around him who are liars, who are wanting what they want out of him or want from him, and they're lying to get it. I cried out with a loud voice, and it happened. And when he heard that I lifted my voice and cried out, that he left his garment with me and fled and went outside. So she kept his garment with her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with words like these, saying, The Hebrew servant whom you brought to us came in to mock me. So it happened as I lifted my voice and cried out that he left his garment with me. So she's using this as a manipulation to lie. See, look, I have his coat. So it was when his master heard the words which his wife spoke to him, saying, Your servant did to me after this manner, that his anger was aroused. Then Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed, mer showed him mercy, and he gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. So here's God's favor, even in times of him going to jail, God's hand is still on his life through the journey. 
right? And this wasn't even his fault. But see, God can use the things that are in our life. And some, I, it just, he's just so wise and so good that even when it's catastrophe, it looks like it's all going wrong. If we keep our heart before God and we keep that cry and that connection with him, I'm telling you, he will, he's like, a, it's like you're a, a boat and the wind of God comes and begins to blow and will shift you and move you and, put, and place you where you need to be. All this is working together for his good. God is setting it up even before Joseph knows the setup. He's setting him up. And it might not be in his time, right? It's not quick. It's not super fast. But it doesn't mean that God's not still involved. The keeper of the prison did not look into anything that was under Joseph's authority because the Lord was with him. And whatever he did, the Lord made it prosper. Now he's in jail. Now he's in jail. And we're, we'll pick this up next week. But I want to close with this because I really believe for those that are listening online or those of us that are in this room to, today, I want to talk to you about Proverbs 5. Because this situation we find with in ministry where you have a man, and well, nowadays it's, it's a man and a, and a man, which is like... You know, it's not, it wasn't the norm. Usually it was a, a pastor and some woman, right? Some woman who has it in and feels like God told her that, I know you're married and you have a wife, but God told me that I'm supposed to be with you. Right? I remember these minis- this, this famous worship leader back in the 90s, or actually early 2000s, and um, he, he felt like God told him he's supposed to get married to another woman. <laughs> Left the wife that he was with, and he's writing amazing worship songs, and goes and gets married to another woman. And this has happened many times. Preachers, all of a sudden, sorry, babe, uh, I found somebody else. God told me they're my wife. No, God didn't tell you that. You're dumb, and that's the enemy. And yeah, so let me get into this. I'm going to leave you with this today. Proverbs 5, verse 1. My son, pay attention to my wisdom. Lend your ear to my understanding that you may preserve discretion and your lips may be, keep knowledge. For the lips of an immoral woman drip honey and her mouth is smoother than oil. But in the end, she is bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Her feet go down to death. Her steps lay hold of hell. Lest you ponder her path of life, her ways are unstable. You do not know them. Therefore, hear me now, my children, and do not depart from the words of my mouth. Remove your way far from her, and do not go near the door of her house. Lest you give your honor to others in your years to the cruel one. Lest aliens be filled with your wealth, and your labors go to the house of a foreigner. And you mourn at last when your flesh and your body are consumed and say, how I have hated instruction and my heart despised correction. I have not obeyed the voice of my teachers, nor inclined my ear to those who instructed me. I was on the verge of total ruin in the midst of the assembly and congregation. Drink water from your own cistern and running water from your own well. Should your fountains be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be only, to, to only your own and not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice with the wife of your youth. As a loving deer and a graceful doe, let her breast satisfy you at all times and always be enraptured with her love. For why should you, my son, be enraptured by an immoral woman and be embraced in the arms of a seductress? For the ways of a man are before the eyes of the Lord. He ponders all his past, his own iniquities, and trap the wicked man, and he is caught in the cords of his sin. He shall die for lack of instruction, and in the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. You see this flippant, disregard, right, for marriage and relationship, that our society doesn't even really honor marriage or even look at it like it's an important thing, but that God actually 
loves marriage and there's a there's a thing about his your relationship with your spouse that that's that relationship is supposed to be the only type of relationship you're supposed to have with that one person and it's a representation of God's heart and who he is in your life and what it should look like and what it should be should be be determined by him and not by the world and there are women and there are men as well okay this isn't just nowadays you got men that are shady they get in the church and they're just in there praising god but really they're checking out all the ladies they're like hallelujah and they're checking out the girls right trying to get the numbers i remember in my church uh, where I got saved, it was in Studio City. It was right in the heart of, like, L.A. with with all these actors, all these people moving from everywhere. They want to be a movie star, right? They want to be somebody. Well, you got these guys who think they're, you know, Brad Pitt or whatever coming into the church, and they're just looking at these church girls who are just trying to do right, and then they're seducing them, and then, yeah, anyways, it happens in the church, and not this church, in Jesus' name. That we will have purity of heart, purity of mind, and there will be a respect and an awe for marriage. Because God's heart for your marriage, God's heart for how God sees it. You know, some of us have been married a couple times, and this isn't to shame you if you have. This isn't to bring shame into your life. But that thing of being unfaithful, that thing of sleeping with somebody else when you're married, it will ruin and destroy your family. It'll ruin and destroy your life. It'll rip your dreams from you. It'll rip them from you, and you'll be left in a tizzy going, oh, my gosh. And a lot of people don't come back from that. A lot of people, their bars are filled with people who've been through broken relationships, and they just can't get past the failure. They can't get past it. And this morning, I just want to encourage you to put God first in your life. Put him first in your marriage. Put him first uh, in your job. Put him first in every area of your life. I'm telling you, he will honor you. He will bless you. He'll protect you. He will be there for you. When everyone fails you, when everyone lets you down, God will not let you down. He will stand with you and he'll protect you. He's given us a sound. Say, heal, deliver me.